AC News, St. John Church News. Here's your anchor, Sandra Dorsey. Good morning, virtual family. Welcome to this week's edition of SJC News. Let's all do our part to belong together, to believe together, and to become everything that the kingdom of God needs us to be. Happy Father's Day. May God bless every father with the best of his spiritual blessings this day and forevermore. We have experienced dangerous heat index temperatures and will continue to do so in the summer days ahead. Please avoid being outdoors for long periods of time. Seek shaded areas when you are out and hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. A neglected or rejected opportunity to tithe is a lost opportunity to receive. Don't let that be you on today. Give back to God a portion of which he so richly has given you. Stay tuned for the ways in which you can give. That concludes this week's edition of SJC News. Be informed, stay connected, and spread the news. Now here's Donya Albright. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Greetings, St. John family, and welcome to today's virtual worship experience. Please be reminded that members of the finance team will be here today from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. to receive your tithes and offerings. You may also take advantage of use of our cash app. Please be reminded that God loves a cheerful giver. And now let us be blessed with a word from our pastor, Reverend Washington. Good morning. This is truly the day that the Lord has made. I greet you in Jesus' love and the power of God's resurrection. Listen, it's a good day for you and I to be together. It's Father's Day, and let me help everyone that's listening and looking today to celebrate, affirm, and encourage the men who are fathers in your life. Maybe not biologically, maybe surrogately in some form, fashion, or particular instance where a male stood in the gap and became a father or was a father figure in a moment for you. Today, we dedicate across the world, celebrating, affirming, not beating, celebrating and affirming and encouraging the gift of fathers. And I wanna say to you, my brothers, happy Father's Day. I am so appreciative to join you in the ministry of fatherhood. And I'm so thankful that God allows us as men to be fathers to children all across the world. There would be no children without a father, and it's so important. So ladies and gentlemen, happy Father's Day on this, the Lord's Sunday. Thank you so very much, fathers, for everything you do. Let's go to God in prayer, shall we? God, we thank you for this moment of celebration, this moment of a clarion call. We thank you for the moment where your word can rightly divide the pathway that we should go in life. We pause and just invite you into our space. We invite you into our sanctuary virtually. We invite you into the, the places where we are now. We may be in two separate states, but we are grateful that even in states that are separated, we can worship together. And so now, Lord, speak to us. Use this, your servant, to bring life and strength to people who are looking and listening. We give you the glory through this moment. We thank you for how you're going to bless. And we say to Jesus and in Jesus' name, amen. Listen, it's a great day and I'm, I'm going to trust that you would listen and be blessed by this message. And let's treat fathers right. So we don't want to be here all day. We want to say what we're going to say and go on and let dads enjoy their day. And so I want to invite you, dad, and I want to invite you, mom and family, to join me in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15. If you would go to Mark, chapter 15, verse number 34, I'm excited for what the Lord promises to do through us today. That's Mark, chapter 15, and verse 34, just one verse. Let's go and hear God speak. And it was the ninth hour when Jesus cried with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Amen. 
My brothers and sisters, on this day, we call your attention to the subject and theme, living with a father's presence, living with a father's presence. We have arrived on this special day in the life of religious circles and in secular circles where the world pauses on this Sunday to attempt to do something that quite frankly is not done enough. We attempt on this day to encourage from a religious perspective. We attempt to affirm from a spiritual perspective. We seek to uplift from a secular and sacred perspective those who are in our lives fathers. We seek to understand them by giving them some freedoms to do some of the things that they want. I must be honest, the commercial season has gotten a little bit better. It's beginning to acknowledge that Father's Day is a day where we should acknowledge but also affirm by gifting men who are fathers in something that they enjoy. But I want to be clear, the world still does not accurately and with enough energy encourage men on Father's Day. Let me share with you what I mean. Most religious entities and most sermons have a tendency to beat on fathers and to tell them what they're doing wrong and to tell them how they should do differently and how they should act like God and how they should be. What, how does that encourage a man who is a father? How does brow beating, how does telling them what they don't do help them to become everything that God has prepared and destined them for? This day, we've got to change that narrative. This day and for future references, we cannot beat men up on Sundays about what they're not doing as fathers, but we've got to encourage, to inform and to equip them and equipping from a affirmative point of view, not from a what's wrong point of view. I've talked with enough fathers across the years to understand that the reason that they are not entering the worship facilities that are Christian is because a lot of times there's not much for them. Fathers don't even have a sacred space where ministries, not men's ministry, but ministries for fathers are equipped in local parishes and churches. That's something that we need to address because the pandemic has also been hard on fathers. And my brothers and sisters, on this day, the Lord worked with me deeply to, to, to prepare a message that would encourage, affirm, and give some divine blessings to those who are fathers and to help those who are not fathers in preparation for how to celebrate. So I want to go to work right now, my brothers and sisters, in this particular passage. We find ourselves in an unusual passage. We typically don't hear and read this passage of scripture except for when it's crucifixion time. You are correct. This is a crucifixion moment. This is where Jesus Christ who we just celebrated on Easter, we bring before you today the text where Jesus allows himself to be completely human. And I want to pause right here and share with you that sometimes the world expects fathers to have godly aspects without remembering that we are formed in human flesh. And I want to remind some of you today that there are some fathers that are in your life, some men who serve as fathers in your life. We are not God. We are made in the image of God, but we have limits and we also have some weaknesses not to be used against us, but to remind us that we are human. It's important, ladies and gentlemen, that you remember that fathers can only take so much pressure before they break down just like anyone else. And their breakdown and their willingness to acknowledge that they have pressure-filled circumstances uh, is not for you to make them feel weaker or emasculate them. It is for you to understand like any other human that a father needs a break just like a mother needs a break. And maybe we don't need to go to the store to shop but maybe we need a few hours on the deck. Maybe we need a few hours alone. Maybe we need a few hours to sit still, watch television, not what you want or think we ought to watch, but watch exactly what we desire. And you allow us to enjoy that experience. The text today calls us into a moment where, and you may, where, where's this going, Pastor? Right here. The text calls us to a moment where we need to embrace the humanity of Jesus Christ. 
I want to be honest. This particular passage and verse has Jesus bellow out something that seems very odd. Jesus says in the scripture, why have you forsaken me? And he's talking to God. My brothers and sisters, we know that the earthly father was named Jesus, but the heavenly and gracious dad that created Jesus and brought him in the form of humankind was God. Jesus, my brothers and sisters, is referencing and talking to God who he knows is his father. And I want to pause because there are some people that are going to have some challenges with this because I refer to God as father. Let me be clear. God, initially, I need to say up front, God is not only above being a man, but also God is also above being called mother as well. What am I saying? I'm suggesting that God chooses to reveal God's presence in the form of a mother and certainly in the form of a father. So where there are some who are really frustrated that men and women continue to use the form word father in reference to God, need to understand that that is how the biblical narrative introduces God to us. And we can grow and we can understand that God moves beyond gender, but we do need to respect that God and the biblical narrative is called father. And it's important because the children of Israel, God's chosen people, knew him as a father in a general kind of sense. They understood that the term father was another word for creator. They understood that things came out of father. They understood that God was conferred to or God was referred to as father because he not only created, but the strength that he used to hold things together. And so the Israelites, God's chosen people, called God father. But what's unique is Jesus calls God family Abba, which is not just father, but it's something intimate. It means that Jesus has a relationship with his God. He refers to God as Abba because it introduces the term relationship. Abba, meaning father, means that there is something intimate. That means that God and Jesus walked together. They talked together. They had communion together. God was present with Jesus. And watch this. Jesus was also present with God. And so Jesus calls God Abba in scripture. He calls God Abba. I want to build for you the narrative that helps us to understand how God and Jesus were not just in the eternal sp space they were relating to one another, creating and doing something. How do we know it? Because when in Genesis, the word says, let us make humanity. He was talking. God was talking not only to Jesus, but also the ecclesia of the of the heavens. God and Jesus worked and formalized humanity to look like them. I want to pause and remind you this gracious morning that we look like God. No matter what the world says we look like, we look like God. No matter how people acknowledge our shortcomings, we look like God. No matter how many times we look in the mirror on and do not like what we see, I want to remind you to not like what you see means that in some way you are not liking the God that made you. My brother and sister, oh, don't you ever forget that you are made in the image of God. And since you're made in the image of God, you look like God. Have mercy. And I want to tell somebody on the way to this powerful word that you and I resemble our God. And God has not made anything that's unattractive. God has not made anything that is not beautiful and handsome. God has made all things well. And that includes you, no matter how big you are. No matter how small you are, no matter how short you are, no matter how tall you are, no matter how odd you feel, God made you in God's image and therefore you are wonderfully made. The text says that in spite of who God made Jesus, in spite of everything that God has formalized in the life of Jesus, Jesus comes to this moment on a cross and says, why have you forsaken me? I want to pause and say there are three things I want us to look at today that I hope will help you understand how we can encourage and how we can live with the presence of a father. Jesus is on the cross. You know that. You know what's going to happen to him. You know he has been beaten all night. You know, he has been pushed from court case or courtroom to other courtrooms. You know that people who were supposed to be with him have left him. We know the story of how he gets here. But I got a question, what makes Jesus on this day bellow out the words, why have you forsaken me? 
Some will jump to the conclusion, that, oh yeah, he was experiencing pain. What I want you to understand that lives in these particular words is the reality of Jesus' humanity. What lives here is the reality that Jesus is a full-fledged human and that he experiences everything that we want to experience and everything in painful circumstances that we can encounter, Jesus experiences it. It makes him and this moment feel as though his father has forsaken him. Oh, my brothers and sisters, I want you to know that the world needs this kind of, of remembering. This world we live in now needs to know that there are instances in life that will pressure us in such a way that it will feel as though the one we have always been able to count on is not present. My brothers and sisters, what makes Jesus bellow these words of why have you forsaken me? Particularly, not only what made him bellow him, but why is pastor preaching? Why are you preaching this doc? I think right now, in the midst of what's happening in this world, someone has to tell God's truth about this passage. My brother and sister, as he bellows it out, I want us to consider three areas. One, I want us to look at the scene of this particular cry from Jesus. I want us to look secondly at the source of this cry. And then I want to follow up when looking at the severity and the salvation of this particular cry. Let's go to work. Uh, my brother, so check it out. Jesus is seen. What is the scene that makes him bellow out? It's important that you understand that there is a scene at work. The scene, according to scripture, is a dark and gloomy situation. It's dark because the sky has shifted. My brother and sister, Jesus experiences a dark sky. And according to scripture, what makes it dark is the heaviness that's taking place. Jesus has been beaten and things have gone from bad to worse. The sky has shifted because the heavens are crying about the burden that Jesus has carried that we know as sin. My brother and sister, he has carried it. It's now thrown on the cross and the scene is gloomy and dark. And watch this, everyone who has promised to be with him has abandoned him. He has nobody to stand or sit with him. The group that he gave and poured into has left him. It's dark, it's gloomy, and everybody's looking to see what he's going to do. When you consider the dark and gloomy skies of Jesus and the scene that's around this. I not only want you to consider physical scene, but consider the, the beating and the emotional tension that is on Jesus. Consider the fact that he is emotionally stressed because he gave so much to the world and it now has taken it and it appears that they have no recollection of how much he's done. Consider the intellectual, the psychological stress that he's under. He's been beaten. His body is racking with physical pain. Ain't nothing divine about this. That's physical pain. And it's caused him, and I want to pause and say to you and to me, there are times, talking about the scene, in our own lives where the pain and the suffering we are enduring distort how we see things in life. The scene is ugly. But get this, it's real, desolate, and hopeless because Jesus is looking at it from the pain and suffering perspective. How many of us can take a few moments to consider the scenes that fathers endure? How many have considered the pain and the suffering that a father goes through in their life attempting to provide protection? Attempting to give provision and attempting to reinforce a greater purpose in their family and particularly their children's lives. How many have considered the nights that fathers stay up worried about how they will make their ends meet so that the family understands that they can count on their father? How many, how many considered that not only fathers that live in the home, but fathers that are non-residential have also crosses to bear and have worried about whether they will make sufficient ends meet 
to help care for and love the children that they have made and been blessed with. The strain, physical, of trying to work two and three jobs, late hours, coming home and attempting to act like Superman, that nothing has been wrong. How many have considered the stress and the strain of having to maintain a particular job because it pays well when it doesn't do anything for them emotionally and intellectually. That's pain, that's suffering. And men who are fathers carry it. And sometimes nobody knows. They turn to the bottle. They turn to the addictive drug. They turn to sex. They turn to people that will just hear their pain as opposed to ignoring their pain and making it about them. Oh, family, not just women, but children do the same thing. Never asking dad, how was your day? Never suggesting that dad can have bad days too. Jesus experiences pain and it distorts how he sees the reality in which he lives. And I'm attempting to tell you that there are fathers because of the pain that they're experiencing who have a distorted look at the realities of their lives. That's why they lash out sometimes. That's why they avoid coming home sometimes. That's why they have no conversation sometimes because they carry burdens that nobody understands. There, there was a, a song, a gospel tune that says nobody knows the trouble I see, nobody but Jesus and me. I don't know about you, but I know black fathers and white fathers and Asian fathers and brown fathers have all had to sing that sometime. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Yes, yes, there are moments when nobody knows what a father is carrying but other fathers, and sometimes we just want somebody to listen. Jesus is experiencing pain and suffering in a way he's never had to before. And fathers experience it too. And when we do, it can distort how we see our realities. Remember, perception is your reality. It doesn't matter what truth is before you. It doesn't matter what facts are before you. What matters is how you perceive the realities that you're in right now. And we've got to be honest. Women, children, listen. The reality that you feel is existing comes from how you perceive life. But the fathers in your life perceive things from a different reality and sometimes it might do you good to listen to the perceptive reality of the fathers in your life. Preach pastor, yes sir. The text says that Jesus says, why have you forsaken? He's experiencing a scene in his life that's been distorted by the realities of the suffering and the pain he's going through and fathers know what that's like. Nobody knows it. Nobody cares to know. Jesus says the scenes make him say, why have you forsaken? The scene, the pain, the suffering. Let's move on, preacher. What, 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 what does that have to do with fatherhood? Now, I'm so glad you asked. Ooh, thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm so glad you asked. Because whether we acknowledge it or not, Father's Day and fatherhood are difficult because the communities we're a part of rarely tell a holistic narrative. What, what is that? They rarely tell the whole truth. The stats tell the truth, but we listen to the narrative that's put out by media and social pundits. The narrative in the communities that say that fathers are absent the narrative that suggests that black fathers are the least active in the parenting process. The narrative that says, and the, and the bad part, the church has bought into it. Yeah, yeah, it has. That's why I said in the beginning, you preach messages that beat down rather than lift up two fathers on Father's Day. Text says, Jesus says, why? The scene has made him say, why have you forsaken? And the scene not just tell a story about a father's pain, but the scene, get this, 
allows the culture of capitalism to suggest that fathers who are black are least active. The devil is a lie, according to the CDC. And let me pause and say, I, I, I know what I'm talking about. I am an authority in this perspective. Ain't no, -uh, no, no. Let me tell you how I know. I did my doctoral work in this here. So I want to go ahead and rebuke all of your ignorance today. Every last bit of it needs to go to hell. This is what you need to know. The CDC and the Pew Foundation have produced for four years in a row that the most active, engaging, and present fathers in the parenting process are black men. The CDC and the Pew Foundation have articulated that no other group of ethnic men are more active than black fathers. We in the house, we're in the parenting process. We take part in the rearing and the raising more than any other ethnic group in the United States of America. Preach the truth. So the narrative shifts today. Well, what about all of these men that ain't doing nothing? The narrative shifts. The stats suggest and tell us that black men are more present in the lives of their children than anybody else. Over 70% rock with it. And it doesn't mean that they have to live with them. Non-residential fathers are also more active. Did you know that? We just don't pay supporting with finances, which I know some of you think that that's what makes you a father. Absolutely not. Let me say this. You don't pay to see your children. The, the scene, what, what's all this mean, Pastor? The scene, I'm talking about the scene of Jesus and the scene of America and the world today. The narrative says that fathers are not there. That's a lie. The truth is fathers are active, particularly to those who are African-American. Active more than any other group. We have to change the narrative so the scene can change. So the church can stop saying we need more men. And we do, but not the way you're thinking. We need to encourage more men. Do you know that the nation of Islam has more men active in their religious circles than the Christian community? Why? Because they know how to encourage and to lift and to tell men who are fathers that they are great and they're kings and they are to lead and not follow. Oh, preach pastor. When has the Christian church led in that? There needs to be a shift in the narrative. We talking about what ain't true instead of what is true. It's more than what your perception is. The scene made Jesus say this. And here's the point I'm trying to make. And I got to cut across the field. I'm trying to make this point to all of us. That Jesus' pain and suffering causes him to feel that his father, it distorts his reality, feel that his father God is not there. And I want to be honest, Jesus is a child of God, as we are. And it looks like his father isn't present to him. And just like the narrative suggests that fathers are not there, there are children who believe that. Because of what the narratives have said. And just because they are perceiving pain as absence, they don't believe that daddy is there. Scenes in lives can affect how children view their fathers. That's why, mother, you not only can't say anything bad, but you also have to encourage the child to have a relationship. I don't care how many times they call and dad doesn't pick up. I don't care how many times you are angry because dad didn't come through like you thought he should come through. You don't know what's happening in that man's life. 
You still have to encourage the child to call dad on birthdays, to reach out to dad on this day, to attempt to make yourself available. And I, I want to share this. Make your father tell you, leave me alone. If you don't do that, you can't say what dad won't do. Make them tell you no. Text says that the perception that Jesus has because of the scene has made him feel that his father has forsaken him. And look at this word. Let's shift. Now we're going to shift to the source. Look at this word forsake. When you, we don't use that kind of word now. We typically use the word deserted, abandoned, absent. Jesus says forsake, which in its original context means to have disowned. Ooh. He feels that his father has just not left the scene because of what's happening, he feels that his father, God, has disowned him, has disassociated from him. The source of his cry is due to, get this, he has an expectation that God, his father, would show up and reveal something and do something to let this community know and to watch this, stop the suffering that he's going through. He expects God to do what God has always done for him. This talking about Jesus. You know, Jesus has really had it easy. What do you mean, preacher? Every time Jesus asks something of God in the human flesh, God gave it. He fed 5,000. He touched and healings were given. He spoke and people listened. He, he was able to turn people toward God and away from foolishness. That just wasn't about him. God was at work. And whatever he prayed, God eventually in that moment or circumstance came. This is the first time when God is not responding to the expectation that Jesus has. Oh, come here for a minute. Whenever dads don't respond to the expectation of children and families. It feels like daddy has disowned. It feels that dad has forsaken. Children, when, God, when daddy doesn't give you what you want, how you want it, you don't think dad loves you. Preach pastor. When we look at how, we come to our father for some things and they don't show the results in the way we want them to. We feel forsaken. We can identify with Jesus. We have prayed for things and it didn't happen. God, I prayed and why you didn't do it. We've asked for things. We've interviewed for jobs. We fasted for breakthroughs. We've lived according to the ways of the scripture. And guess what? Nothing has shifted. God must have forsaken me, left me, disowned, disconnected from me. Why? Because I obviously don't have what I wanted and have prayed for. And therefore, God has forsaken. Now, I know some of you spiritual giants are like, oh, no, that doesn't mean that. That means just not God's will. Stop! This man, Jesus, is on the cross. Stop! When you have cancer and you've prayed, fasted, and lived the way that you want, that God wants you to live, and it has not led to your cure, don't try that. You can't religionize your way out of suffering. No, no, uh-uh, that won't work. When that pain hits you and you've prayed for the release and you've prayed for the shift and you've prayed for the deliverance and it doesn't happen, religionizing it will not resolve it. No, sir, no, ma'am. You got to sit with some stuff and acknowledge that it will feel that God has forsaken you, left you, disconnected from you, disowned you. Jesus said, you've forsaken me. Why? That why must be addressed. Why? God, I've done everything your way. I came down here to do this for you. I loved people that hated me. I kissed those who betrayed me. I stayed with those who left me. And why would you do me like this? Why have you forsaken me? I hear some children. 
I hear some, some families. Why has dad not shown up? The source of his cry is the pain of his father not equaling his expectation. And there comes a moment in life where we need to understand that the expectations we have of dads, fathers, are often desecrated because we don't understand that there are things that dad is doing that we don't understand. God was up to something. Jesus desired that God would reveal God's self in a particular way. And God, get this, says, that ain't the way you need me. You don't need me to show up and reveal my power in the way that you want. I got another way, because something greater is coming. Sometimes the source of our pain with our fathers is the disappointment we have had because they have not met an expectation that is unrealistic for them. Preach, Pastor. There's nothing worse than unmet expectations based upon unrealistic realities. Sometimes we are expecting fathers and husbands and significant others to be with us and do for us what is literally unrealistic. Listen, I was talking with a sister. She's with her, she's married, have a husband. Her and her husband were chatting. She makes twice what he makes in income, but she expects him to carry the majority of the load and he makes two times less than what she makes. That's unrealistic, sweetheart. And it doesn't mean that you should have married differently. It means that you need to adjust what you expect because watch this, you want him to have realistic expectations with you and your body and your emotion, but you don't wanna have realistic expectations with what he has, get out of here. I'm trying to help you. The source of pain is often the disappointment of an unrealistic expectation on dads. Hello, I, 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 I do want you to understand something. That's the source, it makes him say that. Now let's go, let's, let's go home, let's, yeah, let's, let's go home, let's, let's go home. If you're still hanging in here with me, we're getting ready to have something to celebrate. We looked at the scene with the narrative that's wrong about fathers today. We looked at the source, and that source is the disappointment and the disgust of God not returning or revealing God's self in a way that Jesus really fleshly desired. I need to be clear, his flesh, the flesh of Jesus desired a revelation in that way. The spirit knew a little bit better, but the flesh desired. So we need to look at the severity and the salvation of this cry to understand living in a father's presence. You gotta, to understand living in a father's presence, you gotta understand the scene, you gotta understand the source, but you gotta get that salvation and the severity of it. Jesus says, why have you forsaken? We know what that means, me. The severity of this is he is at the brink of death that his physical life is coming to a conclusion. The reality is he will physically no longer see what he has seen for 30 years, 33 years. The reality is that he is about to exit, as Snagglepuss used to say, stage left. There is about to be no more Jesus. Physically, my brothers and sisters, the severity of that, to, I don't care, look, all of us know there's a heaven and a hell, but ain't nobody I know ready at this very moment to exit there. We know it's a reality, but it's not something we wanna leave this earth at this very moment and go to. Yeah, we wanna go to heaven, but we ain't trying to go at, at this second. Jesus knows that there's more but at the second that he's in, the pain that he's in, the suffering and the condition that he's in, he is not necessarily trying to go at that moment. Whew. When we look at it, let me see if I can make it live for, for today. I know you're looking at that. Let me, let me see if I can make it live today. 
Um, th there was a, a, a lady named Libra Hyde, Dr. Libra Hyde. She wrote a book entitled Slavery, Fatherhood, and Parental Duties during the 19th century in black communities. One of the best books I've read. This is, look, I, I'm telling you, I know this stuff about fatherhood. That, that, this is my area. And one of the best books I've read on it was by Libra Hyde, Dr. Hyde. And she wrote a book entitled Slavery. Hear me, fatherhood and the responsibilities or parental duty of fatherhood in the black community throughout the 19th century. Oh my God, powerful. Let me help you get the salvation. Salvation is a word that means healing and made whole. To take what is broken and to put it back together holistically. That's what salvation means. That's why the old preacher will say, you need to be saved. You need to have some salvation in your life, which means take where you are broken and allow God to put you back to wholeness together. Jesus, lastly, in this moment, living with the Father, has to look at the salvation of the circumstance that he's in. This book articulates one of the areas that I found to be true. In doing major research on fatherhood in black communities and in black families, get this, we live under the impression, I got to say this, I got to say this, we live under the cultural oppression of thinking that mothers have to do it all. That the responsibility of life and raising a child is in the hand of a mother. That if mom doesn't do it, it'll never be done. That's the biggest lie I've heard and experienced as a pastor. Mothers do not rear children alone. And I want you to know that how we live with the, with the presence, how we allow the salvation on Father's Day to come is something that many books that are out that you haven't read are revealing now. That during the early periods of black people from Africa coming to this country of America, a lot of the parental duties fell on the shoulders, woo -hoo, of the fathers. Let me help you, let me make it live. Do you know that while black women had to be nannies and surrogate mothers to nurse and, and take care of the slave owners, wives, children, and, and their children, and, and while she was doing that from eight to whatever time and feeding them and, and nursing them, do you know who was taking care and developing the children with life skills, the fathers. The duties and the responsibilities of developing children through slavery, watch this, was trusted to the father. I wanna share this truth with you. Many of you may not know this, but in the black culture, we have this rule that we don't cut the child, the boy's hair until after he's a year old, some say two years old. You don't cut a child's son, you don't cut the boy's hair if he's not a year or some say two years. Do you know where that comes from? In the slave experience, the slave owner would wait until the child was a year old or older, sometimes two, before they would sell off the father to another plantation. And when they would sell them off, the only thing that the father had to remind him in his next place of living and work of the wife and children he had to leave behind were the locks of hair. They couldn't take anything, so they would cut hair off of the sons, and that would be what the father had for years to come. Whew, that's powerful. And out of that came a tradition that you did not cut the child's hair until they were a year or two years old. That's where that tradition comes from.
It was given to the father as he was sold to another plantation. How heart-wrenching is that? Oh, I want you to know that books are being revealed now that are articulating that the responsibility of developing children during the period of slavery was not solely on the shoulders of black women, but that fathers who gave birth to them and fathers who would come fill in for them develop children and help them grow into adults when the mothers had to do other things. It's healing to know this. It's salvation to know that fathers have always been a part of the process. Now, come here, let me help you see where Jesus experiences this salvation. Because you know what? You need to know how he moves from why have you forsaken to father into your hand, I commit my spirit. You heard me. How does he move from why have you forsaken to father into thine hand, I commit my spirit. How do you leave being disowned to trusting God as your father with your soul? How do you do it? Salvation. Salvation, how? Jesus recognizes through scripture, preach pastor, who taught Jesus, well, let me say this, in the process of salvation, Jesus bellows out the 22nd Psalm. Psalm 22 is what he's bellowed out here. Why have you forsaken me? That's Psalm 22, that's David. Jesus is giving the words he got from David. Psalm 22 is what he is reciting at his most crucial part of his life. He about to die and he's reciting the Psalm of David. Where does he get it from? Do you realize that in the ancient biblical culture that fathers were charged and enjoyed the responsibility of teaching their children religious heritage? Woo! You don't hear me. Sometimes we make this overbearing response that I had a praying grandmama. Oh yeah, you had one, but you need to acknowledge I had a praying grandfather, a praying uncle, a praying dad. Because in the ancient world, the children were instructed in their religious upbringing by their fathers. Joseph taught him scripture. Joseph instilled in him Psalm 22. You don't hear me. I see it. You don't. Joseph, in his most difficult, heart-wrenching moment where he feels his father has left him, his father speaks to him. Salvation. We need to acknowledge that it had not been for Joseph teaching Jesus fleshly, earthly Jesus. He would have never had the words to bellow out in his most difficult situation. Preach, dad, preach. Every now and then, world, you got to know that dad has been instructing you and giving you the things you need, even though it didn't come the way you wanted it to. Preach. Every now and then, the world needs to understand that fathers are always present. Listen, a father is present because every day you open your eyes and look in the mirror, you got some dad in you. Every day you're privileged to put one foot in front of the other. You got some of your daddy in you. There are some men who have not seen their father. In years I know them, never seen their father. But they walk like their father. I've heard some uncles and some aunts and families look at somebody they never seen before and say, that's Lonnie Jr.'s boy. How do you know it? Have you talked to him? No. How do you know it? Look at him. He crosses his legs like Lonnie. He, he, he talked like Lonnie. He holds his, watch this, he holds his mouth like Lonnie. He holds his hands like Lonnie. I've seen people know who they were by the mannerism, the behavior, preach pastor, the behavior of a child. It resembles the behavior of a father. I want you to know something that is a very important reality, a salvific moment of a dad in your life. You got some ways 
that are just like your daddy. And I hear you saying, well, my daddy wasn't this and my daddy wasn't that. Your daddy wasn't always w the wrong. Your daddy may have some bad parts, but he's also got some good parts. Your daddy made you. Your daddy gave you half of what you got. My brother and sister, on this Father's Day, we have to affirm fathers because often they have given some of the best that they have to the children that will carry their bloodline on. Jesus said, wait a minute. I can trust my daddy because remember the scripture that says I am the father of one. Whew. When you have seen me, he told people, you have seen the father. And every now and then when you look at yourself in a mirror, you got to acknowledge that some of my daddy is in me. And I want you to know when Jesus realizes that dad, father, Abba is on the inside. I can go where I've never been before because daddy is with me. He didn't need his father in the crucible of his death. The same way he needed his dad in the crucibles of life. He needed God, his father, in a different form. And God showed up in a different way. He learned to trust God, his father, because he showed up in a way he didn't recognize. I want you to know that even today, I got to get out of here, I'm finished. I, I don't want to quit. I got much more in me on this. But I'm going to shut it down. I just want you to know that a part of the healing isn't always dad showing you what you want. Sometimes it's you acknowledging that you got dad on the inside of you. I pray that you have the courage to say to your father, thank you. Thank you for giving me who I am, making me who I am, whether you were there or not, you made me who I am. Thank you for doing the best that you could when you could. Thank you for being what you could be when you were able to be. I ain't beating up nobody today. I'm encouraging dads today. Dad, you can do it. Dad, you can be even more than you are right now. Ask the Lord to be your strength. Have a good day, happy Father's Day, and may you be encouraged.